Some people say Buddhism is just a lifestyle. Nothing more than that. These candles we put in the monastery, so the temple has enough candles. The vacation time is coming, and it is the best time, the best moment of my day. I hope to uh, have a lot less stress in my life. I hope to um, be healthier. This clean and heartfelt greeting place manifested the consideration of those at the temple. Welcome to Meditation for All. I'm Richarda Satalanan. I will be your host for today. During the rainy season, in the countries of Southeast Asia, Buddhists prevail in it's not time when soil and trees are fertilized by the only Mother Nature. It is the period of time that monks and lay people cultivate their mind as wise farmers grow their crops. To be in line with the Buddhist rain retreat, our program during this three months period will focus mainly on the teaching of Buddhist concepts, followed by relevant Buddhist activities, so that all who may be new to Buddhism may understand the Buddhist way of life in a profound way. Continuing from last week, Reverend Tanisaro in his classroom with the 2006 Tamatayat Ordinance talked about the elements of faith in Buddhism and what it actually means. This week, a questionnaire of 14 elements will be given to the students to try to separate out those who are representing Buddhism in order to find out what is Buddhism. Meditation is a way which we use to confirm most things which go beyond what we can prove by scientific uh, methods. Okay, But in order to be able to meditate well enough to be able to use it as a platform to prove things, then your meditation does need to be very robust indeed. Your mind does need to be very still indeed. Just like a camera, if you're going to take a picture down a microscope, then the camera has to be held very, very still in order to get a clean, clear picture. And it's the same thing with the mind. In order for the mind to be able to have an objective view of realities beyond what the eye can see, then uh, you do need to have a mind which is very, very still. And sometimes it takes years to train your mind to such a point. A lot of you come from different backgrounds. Hmm? Some of you come from Western backgrounds. Some come from Thai backgrounds, but are more capable in English. And in fact, I'm sure these backgrounds lead you to have a different sort of difficulties when you are looking at Buddhist concepts. On one hand, Westerners tend to feel that Buddhism is very different from the sort of interpretations which other religions give. For example, in the West, often we say that Buddhism is not even a religion at all. Why? Because it doesn't involve a belief system. Or doesn't it? Can you explain everything in Buddhism without having to have any sort of belief? Do we have no nothing like faith in Buddhism? In fact, it's not completely true. Also, we have elements of faith in Buddhism. But there are sorts of steps of faith which I just described a little bit earlier, where you back up your faith by your own spiritual research until you have confidence that you've understood something correctly. So we do have faith also in Buddhism. It's not that we don't have it. So would you use this to qualify Buddhism as a religion or not? Some people say Buddhism is just a lifestyle. Nothing more than that. But again, 
you know, it depends what part of Buddhism you look at. You can belong to another religion, but practice Buddhism quite happily. Think that's true? I even heard one temple go as far as to say, we welcome Buddhists of all religions. That's quite a daring statement. So it's almost as if Buddhism doesn't seem to have any common ground with religions at all. It has no conflict. If you're in Thailand, you often hear the words, all religions are the same. They all teach people to be good. Hmm? Think that's true? And then you get some religions saying that to kill people from belonging to other religions is was a way to go to heaven. And certainly Buddhism doesn't have teachings like that. Yeah? So again, there are sometimes some misunderstandings concerning exactly what Buddhism is like. And it's for this reason I'd like you to look in your notes where you see a little questionnaire standpoints in your handout. It's got a series of 14 questions. Not questions, but really they are statements which you should try to separate out into those which are representing Buddhism or monotheistic religions like Christianity, Islam, or Judaism. Hinduism also is also included in this. Well, it's not monotheistic, is it? Let's just take the three anyway. And humanism. You all know what humanism is? Humanism. Humanism is a sort of lifestyle where you believe that nothing which is Nothing exists beyond what you can see with your eyes. And when you die, then that's the end, okay? As for monotheism, of course, it's based on some belief in a god. Some of the statements are shared between one or more of these categories, in which case you can put them in the... Uh, the intersecting parts of the circle. Some may be shared by all. See if you can fit them into the right uh, category. So you can start ahead of me and I'll gradually catch up with you. Sin and guilt are not constructive emotions. Even if you have done something wrong, you should start afresh and take better responsibility for your own life. Which traditions do you think this is representative of? Sorry? Buddhism? Humanism. 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 How about Buddhism? Buddhism, does it like guilt or not? And do you have to be guilty about it? Shame means that you shouldn't do it in the first place. You're so ashamed of it, then you wouldn't do it in the first place. But guilt is normally it means that you feel negative about it after you've already done it. And in Christianity, guilt is something which they work a lot on. In Buddhism and in Unism, we don't support people to feel guilty. It's better that people put the past aside if they've got something they feel bad about and start again and never think back to the bad things which they've done in the past otherwise the bad things which they've done in the past will only send more negativity into their present it doesn't mean that we are shameless about our past but it means that we give ourselves a new chance we start afresh okay so number one would be included in both humanism and in Buddhism. Number two, science is the most trustworthy tool to determine what is true. Arbitrary faith, authority, revelations and altered states of consciousness are at best a useful source of ideas to give us new ways of looking at the world. 
humanism. Any others? No. Number three, skepticism has its place. There are times when questioning is useful and times when it can be beneficial to give things the benefit of the doubt. Buddhism? Yeah, humanists are usually very skeptical about everything. So they certainly like skepticism, okay? In Buddhism we've got this sort of uh, dichotomy between times when it's it's useful to use uh, what we call the, the Buddha's teaching where he says you should not believe things because of hearsay, you should not... you remember what sutta it is? Well, if you think of it then tell me, okay? I can't remember it for the moment. Uh, this is quoted a lot, okay? And normally it's not translated in a very good way and this makes a lot of Western Buddhists very skeptical about everything anything they don't have immediate proof of, then they discard it. So you get a lot of people in there not believing in Japan category because of this sutta, okay? But in fact, what the sutta is trying to tell us is that in the absence of anything more trustworthy, then you should be skeptical of things. But if your teacher advises you strongly to try something anyway, then you should take that advice on the benefit of the doubt and give it a good and a worthy try before discarding it. Okay, So it's not that you should be a complete skeptic if you're a Buddhist, but if, you're, if you trust in your teacher and your teacher gives you some advice, even though it may not be easy to uh, accept it in the beginning, but you should try it anyway. At least give it a fair trial. And in that way, uh, you can learn from things even though they might not make sense to you in the beginning. For example, there was a nun who instead of being sent to meditate, she was sent away to polish what we call gaton, which are like spittoons made of chrome. You know what a spittoon is? In the olden days people used to uh, eat food and they used to spit out the remnants into a certain sort of basket or uh, container called a spittoon, okay? And in Thailand these used to be made of chrome. And instead of being allowed to meditate, she was sent off unwillingly to polish these spittoons. You know, instead of being able to do the nice uh, meditation quietly, she had to do the menial work. and. She didn't understand why she had been sent to do this by her teacher. But later, as she was polishing the uh, spittoons, as they became more shiny, they reminded her of the brightness inside her. And as a result of that, she in fact attained uh, a spiritual attainment while she was doing the polishing, which maybe she would never have done if she had been just meditating. So although she didn't understand why she had been asked to do this by her teacher, but in the end, later she, she realized the reason why. Okay, so sometimes it's useful to doubt things, but if you, if you trust in your teacher, then it is, you should give things a fair trial. Okay? So, Buddhism also believes in the benefit of the doubt, and humanism probably does as well. There is no compelling evidence for the existence of gods, ghosts, heaven and hell, communicating with the dead through mediums or any other super mundane phenomenon. Humanism. Not Christianity, I shouldn't think. And not Buddhism. The theory of evolution presents a serious threat to our fundamental beliefs. Buddhism? You think evolution is at odds with Buddhism? Yeah, why? Mm. 
Well, we look at that more tomorrow, okay? But for the church, evolution is a serious problem, much more than for Buddhism, where it's simply a question of what interpretation you have. Because Buddhism isn't founded upon the necessity to believe in some sort of evolution uh, story. But for Christianity, if you don't believe in creation, and if you don't believe that God created the world, you have a big problem for your faith. It's like the cornerstone of your faith is it's, it's being uh, destroyed. So evolution set itself up as an arch enemy for Christianity from its earliest days. But for Buddhism, it doesn't matter what you believe in evolution, whether you believe in it or what you believe about it, you can still do the practice. Okay? As for humanism, they're not interested in these sort of questions anyway. So they don't find that evolution is a serious threat. Buddhism, we don't find it's a serious threat. But later on in the course, we'll compare about how evolution explains things and how and what is more important to Buddhism. Okay? <laughs>
People expend great effort to create mammoth candles of extraordinary beauty. It is the season of candle processions, but only for these special sized candles, of course. And people along the street can welcome and admire the candles, rejoicing in the merit of their creators. The candles tell people that the time to ignite their inner lights will soon arrive. It is believed that a person who wants to gain wisdom should donate a big candle to the temple. believe this activity can bring them not only wisdom but happiness and healthy eyes. These candles we put in the monastery so the temple has enough candles to brighten up the monastery throughout the season. It is better to have only one big candle that lasts throughout these hundred days. The preparations for the Buddhist Lent combine a unity of purpose with well-scripted management. A spirit of peace is needed. The reverence for serenity will create the sacred light of wisdom. It seems as though people let their minds melt and mold with one another they transform into a single candle of faith, waiting for the right time to become the glorious flame of wisdom. Yan Pasa is the name of this festive candle. Like the great Indian poet Rabindranath Tragore wrote in one of his later poems, Touch me with thy fire, burn and purify my life. Lift my body and make it thy temple lamp. Let my songs be the oil that feed the flame. Yes, it is the absolute truth of Buddhism that ignites the inner light and provides a happy existence along the road of life with the passage of nights and days. And with the touch of the absolute truth, 
life becomes the lamp, the flame of wisdom in the flow of a bittersweet path. And the sweet serenity of mind that comes from meditation is the oil that keeps the flame alive. Having seen those beautiful pictures, you probably feel as peaceful as I do. Now let's enjoy more inner peace with Reverend Biasi Lo. Time runs that fast, doesn't it? This is session four of part three. Welcome everyone to meditation for all. Meditation time is coming. And it is the best time, the best moment of my day, and I hope you would feel the same. This is the best time of your day as well. Meditation is available to everyone, and if you are newcomer, don't worry. Let's start meditation after we talk a little about it. Light of serenity is very essential to everyone. It originates from inside. Is the light of wisdom. In the physical world, the body and our life could get older and older, but with the light of serenity, life is forever young. And if you are quite ready, we will start to learn meditation and practice it together. And if you are ready. Just take a good deep breath. Let's try. And gently close the eyes. Follow the deep breath inside the body. And in the middle of the body. In the middle of the abdomen, it is where the in breath will go to the deepest point inside. I will call this, as before, as usual, the turning point. It is the turning point of the in breath. This is where we call the station of peace. Allow the consciousness or the feeling inside to exist or to greet the turning point inside. So now we are inside with the. Centering mind. The mind centralizes itself and is now existing at this turning point peacefully. This is the origin of life, and according to Buddhism. It is always bright. The feeling could feel the brightness inside. The feeling is just how we feel and what we feel. We don't care about the exact happening, but the feeling says we are inside. It is something bright all around. This is the way we do softly in the process of meditation. Allow 
the mind to exist inside the body. Allow the mind be surrounded by the feeling of brightness all around. This is how we spend the beginning of meditation time for a while. The physical body of ours will get torn off over time. The physical being will be worn off over time. But the serenity, which is bright, I call this the light of serenity inside is forever young. Physical body can grow old, but the internal being is just to grow a glow, always bright and shining over time. So welcome the feeling of brightness inside the body. Every time the mind is at the center of the body, it is the possibility of glow, of shining a glow. So take a rest, rest your mind inside the body and go back to the original state of the mind. Amid the brightness, allow the mind to expand. Let the area, the volume of brightness expand and enlarge to an airless horizon. Allow the brightness grow bigger in an endless volume. Let this process of radiation continue. Amid the feeling of contentment in the brightness all around, big volume of brightness. The very center of the body is the brightest above all. The tiniest point in the middle of the brightness it's like you can place a diamond in the middle of the full moon brightness. The round brightness of the moon is shining and we can place the most precious and bright diamond in the middle of the full moon brightness. Observe the brightness of the diamond in the middle of the round full moon. This is the very origin of the mind. And in Buddhism, this is the station of brightness. Allow the mind to enjoy the diamond in the middle of the moon continuously for a while.
enjoy the bright diamond in the middle of the moon and sharing this kind of brightness to everyone. Sharing is by radiating the brightness outwards to the environment. As we are a decorative items of the planet, imagine how beautiful the world do imagine how beautiful the world could turn if a single decoration on earth is so beautiful a single one like we are is beautified by inner light if everyone in the world enjoys inner light the world could be beautified by the power of all enjoy expanding the brightness outwards the area of brightness is now beyond trace is growing expanding bigger and brighter to everywhere wishing everyone on earth could one day enjoy their inner light and of course inner light the light of serenity could be achieved only by meditation I would like to say congratulations to every of you, all of us who give yourself a chance to gain inner light for your own benefit. Now enjoy the middle of brightness by observing the bright diamond in the middle of the shining moon always remember the physical body belongs to the world remember the physical body just belongs to the world we can be older we can be remember the physical body belongs to the world we can get older and torn off and worn off but the inner body the inner being is up to ourselves we can beautify the inner being by meditation and we could regain the inner light of serenity so life is in our hands we can make our life brighter and brighter by meditation and we could make we could make the world brighter as well by sharing the inner light by means of radiation of brightness inside. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are ready, you can open up the eyes so slowly. You can count down from three to one to zero. Take a deep breath again to reconfirm the existence of the turning point. You can prove to yourself by now that meditation time 
is the most precious moment in your life. This is the best time of your day. Congratulations. Until we meet again with brightness in insight together. สวัสดี Next, where are we interview Nicholas Pascal? One of ordinance on the International Ordination Program, 2006 of b a t p a t a m a g a y a Nicholas ordinations was on July 22nd, which means that he has already become a monk. We would like to take this opportunity to rejoice in his merit. His mother's tears of joy when he asked for forgiveness and permission to ordain, in order to be unblemished in his monkhood, made several cry. At this moment. We'll all share the same thoughts that he will make a good monk. สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีครับ Welcome to this special program on the International t a m a t a y a t Ordination Ceremony at Wat p r a t a m a g a i in Thailand on occasion of Buddhist Lent 2006. Wat p r a t a m a g a i offers several ordination ceremonies throughout the year. There's the lifetime ordination ceremony for people who wish to become monks for the rest of their lives on w i s a k h a b u c h a d e y on the sixth lunar month of the calendar year, and there's also three other types of ceremonies happening on Earth Day, on the start of Buddhist Lent, and the start of the summer season for Thai students. And these last three ceremonies last for short term. For the ceremony on Buddhist Lent. There's two types of programs. There's the program uh, geared towards um, Thai-speaking people and lasts for three months. And there's also the program for international for international participants called the International t a m a t a y a t Ordination Ceremony, which lasts for one month. Within that last group, there's two types of of programs. The first one is geared towards Chinese-speaking people. And the second one is geared towards English-speaking people. So here today on this program, we will be focusing on and interviewing people who wish to participate in the International t a m a t a y a t Ordination Ceremony geared towards English-speaking people. Here with us today is Nicholas Pasco from London, who will join us and talk about his experience um, coming here to train to ordain as a Buddhist monk. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Nicholas Pasco. I'm 19 years old. I live in London. My profession before I came here was a design engineer, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so, is this your first time in Thailand? Not my first time in Thailand, no. Mm. But I haven't been here for nine years before today. Oh wow! Mm. But is uh, and is this your first time ordaining? It is, yeah. And so, how how do you feel right now? Um. Well, I feel nervous but excited at the same time. I know it will be a positive experience for me, and hopefully, I can look back on it in the future and maybe do it again. Why did you decide to ordain as a Buddhist monk this year? Well, my brother did it last year, the same program, and my mum asked me to do it for her this year. And seeing as she's raised us single-handedly from her uh, since we were children, I think it's a small token of my appreciation towards my mother. Oh, great! And I think I know it will make her very happy. How much do you know about ordaining? Not a great deal, I'm afraid. My brother's told me a little bit, um, so I'm not really sure exactly what's in store for me. But I guess I'll find out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> what did your brother tell you about being a Buddhist monk? Well, he said uh, that you wake up at maybe four o'clock in the morning, you sleep on a, a wooden floor, and you eat two meals a day. So <laughs> it doesn't sound very good from what he's told me, but. You know, I've spoken to other people about it, and they've said it's going to be a really good experience for me. I see. And so, is this is this something that you feel is going to be difficult for you going into this this program? I think it'll be hard to adjust to, but I think eventually it'll be okay. How did you get interested in Buddhism? Well, I wasn't very interested at the start until uh, my brother came and did the same program. And he came back uh, saying it was really good for him. It's a good experience. And so I read up on the internet and uh, spoke to some people about it. And they said it would be uh, be really good for me. So I thought I'd give it a go. 
Did your brother say anything in particular about his experience and becoming a Buddhist monk? Not, nothing really specific, but when, you know, when he came back, I could tell he's, he's changed a lot. He's matured, and his perspective on life is totally different now. Um, and I think his fortunes have changed as well, because before he was a soldier in Iraq, and now he's landed a job with Formula One. Oh, wow. So I think it's, it's good for him. You know, it's given him the confidence to go and uh, seek his goals, and hopefully it'll you know, be the same for me. You said before that you used to uh, work as a designer. Design engineer. A design engineer, mm -hmm. and are you still are you still doing that or? Well, I've actually given up my job just to come here and uh, ordain as a monk. Mm -hmm. And when I come back, well, the world's my uh, my oyster. <laughs> so you're ordaining for one month here. One month, indeed, yeah. So how how was it deciding not to continue on with that job just to ordain in the ceremony? Well, to be honest. Uh, I was getting quite bored of my job. It was the same thing every day, and uh, it's getting really stressful. And I thought, you know, I need to have some time out and relax. So it's probably the best way to do it is to come here and meditate. Have you meditated before? I haven't, no, I'm afraid. So hopefully I'll learn. Well, you'll definitely have some, some time to, to yeah. meditate. <laughs> yeah, I think too much time. <laughs> And so, um, when you ordain as a monk, you have to uphold about 227 precepts. Right. How do you feel about, about upholding all these, all these precepts as a monk? Well, I think it's okay if it's for one month, but I'm not sure if I can do it uh, any longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe uh, after the program, you know, things will change. Um, what do you think you'll get out of this program? Do you have any expectations c coming into the program? Not really. I have no idea at the moment. Um, all I know is that I know it will change me for the better. I mean, um, before, you know, drinking, smoking, um, and now hopefully I'm going to stop that and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have a cleaner lifestyle in general. How are you approaching these changes coming into this program? Um, Has it been difficult for you? It's been quite hard, but. You know, when I think about it, drinking and smoking is not good for my health. So, in the long run, it's going to be uh, it's going to be good, uh, good for me, it's beneficial. Mm -hmm. And you said you're doing this for your mom. Mainly, yeah. Mainly for your mom. Mm -hmm. And so, how how did she react when you when you said that you're going to ordain for her? Oh, well, she won't stop her, you know, boasting to her friends about <laughs> about me doing this for her. Um, the same with my brother last year as well. It's, you know, it's making her very happy, so I, uh, I like to see her happy. So, was it a big decision for saying me? for you saying yes, you will ordain for your mom? Yeah, at, you know, as I said at first, I didn't have any interest whatsoever in it, um, but I read more into it, and hopefully, it's going to be very good. So, you came all the way from from London to Thailand to ordain. Yeah. How how do you feel about? this ordination ceremony in Thailand. You'll be spending a month in Thailand and you said you came here before. Yeah. And do you think this time will be any different? Yes, because uh, when I went before I was just a little child on holiday and now I'm here to ordain as a monk. So yeah, it'll be very different. <laughs> so, ordaining as a monk is not an easy task. No, I can't imagine it to be. <laughs> <laughs> have you told your friends about this and if you have have they reacted in any sort of way? I have, yes. Yeah. Some don't really understand the whole concept of it, but others have been quite supportive, saying that, you know, what have I got to lose? Mm -hmm. It'll be good for me, and just give it a go. Mm -hmm. It seems that that's definitely what, what you've been doing, um, pretty yeah. much. So, with all these drastic changes, you said you quit your job yeah. um, to participate in the ceremony. And you gave up smoking and drinking, mm -hmm. which is not an easy task. Definitely not, no. <laughs> and so with all these changes, how do you think your life will change after you participate in this program? Well, hopefully it will be for the, for the better. Um, I hope to uh, have a lot less stress in my life. I hope to um, be healthier. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it so far. At least your mom will be happy. <laughs> yes, at least <laughs> she'll be happy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think my brother as well. <laughs> <laughs> so is he a big supporter? He is. Yeah, he's the one that's pretty much spurred me on to do it. Um, 
it's, as I said, when he came back from uh, being a monk, he's the one that made me change my mind and, you know, go into it as well. Is he an older brother? Younger he's older, brother? yeah. Okay. Five years older. Mm. What made him decide to become a monk? Well, he, he'd do anything for my mum. He's that kind of person. Um, he just left the army and he had nothing, nothing to do, so he thought, you know, why not? Let's go do it. And so I'm pretty much doing the same, apart from that, I've quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe afterwards you'll get an even better job. Yeah, I hope uh, I'll have the confidence to, uh, you know, search my, uh, my goals or mm -hmm. find my, uh, my niche in the career industry. <laughs> Do you have any, anything in mind at this, mo at this moment in time? Nothing yet, no. Um, I hope to study more next year, but I'm not sure what yet. Hopefully, you have Hopefully a month. Hopefully I'll find out <laughs> what I want to do while I'm here. Right. Do you think that you will change just as your brother changed after he became a monk? Well, I know I'll change while I'm here because they're going to shave my head and my eyebrows off. <laughs> but when I leave, yeah, hopefully I will change for the better. So how do you feel about shaving your head and your, your eyebrows? Well, I don't think anyone was really going to be too happy about it, you know, themselves if they're going to have their heads shaved. but. You know, hair grows back, so <laughs> it's a big I shouldn't commitment. dwell on it too much. Mm -hmm. But just as he said, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hair grows back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it seems as though Nicholas Pasco is one who is very dedicated and has decided to quit smoking, quit drinking, and actually quit his job to come to this program and become a Buddhist monk for one month. And he's doing this for his mother and brother. And so, Nicholas, do you have anything else you'd like to, to add? Nope, nothing I can think of at the moment. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming and joining us today. You're very welcome. <laughs> and on next week's episode, we'll have more interviews with participants in the International Tamatayat Ordination Ceremony. And so, until then, join us next time. Swatika. Swatika. Next, meet with Vera. She will take you to two important places on the route of the great teacher in Tamakai tradition. Let's find out more on the tour of the temple. Sawadee My name is Vera Rungchugul and you're joining me on the tour of Wat Pratamakai in Patum Thani, Thailand. On last week's episode, we took you to the place where the seed of Dharma was planted, to the pavilion known as the Jatu Maharachika. But today, you'll be officially welcomed to the temple at the original greeting point of Wat Pratamakai. Today, we're standing right in front of the original reception center of the temple at this information area. Back then, you would be shown a slideshow presentation of the temple and be offered clean drinking water. In the past, everyone who came to Wat Pratamakai was not welcomed by any fancy welcome drinks or material gifts, but rather by the pure hearts of those at the temple, through the genuine smiles in their eyes, allowing a bond of trust to be established. But most importantly, visitors in the past were welcomed by the cleanliness of the bathrooms. The restroom was the first necessity of those traveling to the temple from far away. In the past few decades, coming to the temple was not convenient nor easy. About 20 years ago, it took a few hours to get here, traveling on this red, dusty, small, unpaved road to get to this temple on the outskirts of Bangkok Metropolitan. And this is not to mention those who didn't have a car. Thus, when everyone came to this temple, they would rush to the restroom to clean up their faces and hands. In this way, Kunyai's teachings were put into practice in this unbiased way of greeting people. There's an old Thai saying that goes, if you want to know what a temple is like, look at its restrooms. If you want to know what a house is like, look at its kitchen. A clean restroom reflected a clean and wholesome temple. Those who saw the clean restrooms would get the feeling 
that the temple had good teachings to offer. The greeting point the people appreciated the most, of course, was the first 20 units of toilets. It was never the luxury of these toilets that was emphasized, but rather its cleanliness. People always remembered these clean toilets simply made of cement block, without tiled flooring and without a mirror. Besides the toilets, it only had washing basins and paper towels. Only the basic necessities were provided, honoring the principles of simplicity and sufficiency. People cleaned their feet with the rug provided outside because they were afraid to dirty the clean toilets inside. The restroom was absolutely dry. According to Kunyai, only the toilet bowl was allowed to be wet. But some people who did not know this liked to wash their feet inside the room. As a consequence, the temple now lays a towel in front of each toilet in order for the people to clean their feet before entering the toilet block. Also, restroom shoes are now provided inside. Kunyai taught that we must do whatever we can to make those who use the facilities after us feel as if they were the first ones to use it. In order to honor Kunyai's teachings and respect for cleanliness, visitors are asked to take off their shoes, place them in the designated areas, and use the bathroom shoes provided inside. Keeping the restroom clean is even incorporated in the training programs organized by the temple in order to help individuals be more responsible and considerate and to help them to learn the Dharma. This clean and heartfelt greeting place manifested the consideration of those at the temple to fulfill the needs of those on their first visit to the temple. Through the cleanliness of the bathrooms, people would feel at ease and heartily welcomed. As such, the cleanliness of the bathrooms was a show of hospitality for those who came after a long and tiring journey. Everyone who came to Wat Pratamakai would be welcomed by the clean water, clean bathrooms, nice words, and friendly smiles. This was the principal charm of Wat Pratamakai that is still maintained up until this day. And you can experience this for yourself when you come to visit Wat Pratamakai. Hope to see you soon. Sawadeha. That's it for today. Thank you for watching Meditation for All. Hope this program was enjoyable for all of you, as it was for us to make it for you. Anumotana Bun, which means in the ancient language of Pali, spoken by the Lord Buddha, be rejoiced in all your good deeds. Until then, สวัสดีค่ะ.